Good afternoon. The first item of business is portfolio questions. Uh, the first question wasn't lodged. Question number two, Peter Chapman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions Police Scotland has had with local authorities regarding the management of unauthorised camping by gypsy travellers. Minister Annabel Ewing. The policing of unauthorised camping by gypsy uh, travellers is a matter for Police Scotland, as are indeed any discussions between Police Scotland and local authorities regarding that issue. Where issues arise that concern the wider policy and legislative framework uh, that ministers are responsible for, uh, then the Scottish Government would give due consideration uh, to those issues. Peter Chapman. Thank you. Uh, I'm grateful for, to the Minister for that answer. But I have raised this issue previously here, and I will continue to do so until the SNP ministers actually address the problems instead of dodging the questions. The police and local authorities have both made it abundantly clear that they do not have the powers to deal with unauthorised encampments. So will the minister commit to giving the police the powers and local authorities the, the resources to deal with these sites that cause so much distress to settled communities? Minister. Um, well, I would say to uh, the member uh, that, um, of course, the, the lead responsibility as regards management issues here lies with local authorities. I would also say that as far as policing, policing issues are concerned, it is uh, the case that further to Crown Office, Procurator, Fiscal Service guidance, there is a presumption against prosecution for unauthorised camping. However, at the same time, uh, I think the member should be aware that this presumption can be overridden by public interest considerations such as, for example, road safety, public health hazard grounds. And of course, at the same time, it is the case, of course, that the police will investigate any allegations of criminal offences or antisocial uh, uh, behaviour. So uh, though that is the position as, as it stands. Uh, the member may also be aware that, um, uh, that draft guidance on managing unauthorised camping has been worked up, uh, and that draft is currently with COSLA uh, to give their final consideration to the draft. So I'm sure the member will be interested to see that guidance when it, it comes out, which I think is expected quite soon indeed. And the final thing I would say, presiding officer, is that uh, the gypsy traveller communities are varied and diverse and have a long and proud history and a right to exercise their traditional way of life, which right, just like any other citizen, must be exercised with regard to others. John Mason. Hey, thank you, presiding officer. I mean, given that gypsy travellers are one of the clearly most discriminated groups uh, in our society, uh, can the minister give us any guidance as to whether local authorities, especially in the North East, have gone anywhere in providing additional sites, recognised sites, which has long been a recommendation? Minister. Um, I, I would say to the member that, um, that local authorities are required by law to prepare a, a local housing uh, strategy, and this strategy must reflect accommodation needs in the relevant local authority area, which, of course, include those of gypsy uh, uh, travellers. Um, and, of course, the decision uh, as to whether or not to provide a particular uh, site is, of course, a matter uh, for the local authorities. But I will ensure that the members' uh, comments are passed to my uh, uh, colleagues in the Equalities uh, and Local Government team. Mary Fee. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Does the Minister agree with me that instead of prosecution and persecution of the gypsy travelling community, we need a much more collaborative approach across all portfolio, portfolio areas with local authorities and with local communities to not only ensure better site provision for the gypsy travelling community, but also a better understanding of their culture and lifestyle, which in turn would help to eradicate the discrimination that gypsy travelling communities face? Um, I thank the, the member for a question. I know that she has a very long-standing and honourable uh, involvement in this uh, matter over many years in this Parliament. Um, what I would say is that many of the issues that she raises do fall within uh, the, the portfolio of my Equalities colleagues, but again, I will ensure that her comments are, are addressed, are passed on to them. But uh, hopefully the, the draft guidance that is uh, uh, shortly to be published will uh, helpfully, hopefully answer at least some of the, the concerns that the member has, has raised. Question number three has been withdrawn. Question number four, Kate Forbes. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on its consideration of the proposal to introduce travelling domestic abuse courts in the Highlands. Cabinet Secretary, Michael Matheson. Uh, Sheriff principals are responsible for court programmes which include domestic abuse courts. This includes assessing whether the volume of domestic abuse cases in a sheriffdom would support either a specialist court or clustering of domestic abuse cases in 
other court locations. It is the statutory responsibility of the Sheriff Principal to arrange the court programme in their area, and the Scottish Government has no locus or control over decisions relating to court programmes. More generally, it is recognised that domestic abuse courts can play a valuable role as part of an overall effective court programming approach to dealing with domestic abuse cases. Specialist domestic abuse courts, clustering or fast-tracking of these types of cases is happening at courts around the country. In Grampian and in the Highlands and Islands, the Scottish Court and Tribunal Service are working with justice partners and the Sheriff Principal to continually review the arrangements for hearing domestic abuse cases and currently favour and operate a fast-track system, ensuring that such cases are scheduled within the 8 to 10 week target. Kate Forbes. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Would the Scottish Government um, agree with me that having dedicated procurator fiscals and sheriffs specifically allocated to domestic abuse is, would ensure that procurator fiscals and sheriffs have the appropriate expertise and sensitivity to the cases and that there is consistency in procedures and sentencing? Cabinet Secretary. Well, as I mentioned in my uh, response to the member, there is um, uh, several domestic abuse, uh, dedicated domestic abuse courts in Scotland, in uh, Glasgow and in Edinburgh. We also have the cluster courts operating in uh, Falkirk, Dunfermline, Livingston and in Ayr. And as I mentioned, in other areas where there is not the uh, quantity of cases, the throughput of cases in courts, uh, uh, in other areas that the Scottish Court and Tribunal Service, almost share of principles, tend to fast track uh, these uh, cases. However, as part of the work which has been taken forward under the equally safe strategy, the Scottish Government is uh, developing, uh, a delivery, developing delivery plans which will look at both medium and long term improvements uh, that can be made to the justice system for all victims of this type of violence, including uh, domestic abuse victims and their children. These delivery plans, though, presiding officer, are currently being worked through with partners uh, such as the Scottish Court and Tribunal Service, who are represented on the Justice Expert Group on uh, the Violence Against Women and Girls Joint Strategic Board. And that work will be taken forward over the coming weeks and months ahead with a view to addressing the types of issues that the member has raised. And I know that the Crown Office are keen to be, play their part in this in ensuring that they have the right expertise in dealing with these cases when they are brought before our courts. Claire Baker. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I would like to raise two points. While the Cabinet Secretary is correct in saying the establishment of domestic abuse courts has been led by the senior judiciary, um, who have responsibility for the court programme in their area, can he confirm that it would be possible for the Scottish Government and the Parliament to legislate to establish domestic abuse courts if we felt it was the best way to make further progress? And also in the debate in September, the Minister raised training for sheriffs and summary sheriffs. Can the Cabinet Secretary confirm that while it is part of the induction training for new members of the judiciary, domestic abuse education is not at the moment compulsory for all sheriffs and summary sheriffs? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the Member uh, raises an, uh, an interesting point around the uh, suggestion that we uh, could legislate an issue of creating uh, specialist courts. And although that technically may be the case, uh, I'm not entirely sure whether that would uh, achieve the desirable effect we're looking for, and that is the effective use of court time in dealing with these cases. Uh, and that's why the Scottish Court and Tribunal Service, along with the Crown Office, tried to take a flexible approach to these matters, <coughs> where they can uh, cluster cases, clustering together, so that they can make sure that they have the special sheriff there alongside that, the fiscals to be able to deal with it uh, for that period of time, and the necessary support services in the court where they don't have that throughput of cases within these individual courts, they seek to fast-track them as quickly as possible and to make sure they also have the necessary fiscals and the necessary support services there during the time when these cases are being taken through at the court. So I think it's important that we take an approach that allows us to have a flexible model in different parts of the country uh, that reflects the demand that's necessary in these individual areas. And uh, Sheriff Principals and the Scottish uh, Court and Tribunal Service are keen to make sure that they continue to uh, take that type of approach. In relation to uh, matters relating to uh, training of the judiciary, uh, the member will also be uh, aware that uh, matters in relation to training of the judiciary are not matters for ministers, they are matters for the Lord President, who is responsible for the training uh, and support provided to uh, members of our judiciary, including uh, summary sheriffs. The Judicial Institute, uh, which uh, is uh, headed by uh, the Lord President, is responsible for these training provisions. You are, the member is correct to say that it is part of the induction training 
uh, for judiciary uh, domestic uh, violence is an issue which they are provided with training in. Uh, there are training provisions for other sheriffs who can opt into those programmes as and when they choose to do so. I am sure the member has got no doubt those sheriffs who have a particular interest in specialism in this area are the very ones who are most likely to make use of that type of flexible training regime, which is there in order to make sure they have been given the right type of support and advice and the right type of uh, information that is necessary to ensure that they are able to discharge their duties as best as possible. Question number five, Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when the Cabinet Secretary for Justice last met Scottish Women's Aid and what issues were discussed. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Scottish Ministers meet with key stakeholders such as Scottish Women's Aid and local Women's Aid organisations to help inform thinking around strategies to prevent and eradicate violence against women. Uh, most recently, I met with representatives from Edinburgh's Women's Aid on the 15th of September last year uh, and was given a tour of the services offered and spoke to staff and service users. Oh, the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. And I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary uh, could tell us what steps the Scottish Government is taking to ensure that children have equal access to justice as direct victims of coercive control within the domestic uh, the draft domestic abuse offences bill and whether that's something that's under consideration because that has been raised by um, Scottish Women's Aid. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary. Well, saying officer, the memory is a very uh, important point and I think um, uh, the uh, bill which we intend to bring before Parliament in uh, this session uh, in order to deal with psychological coercive and controlling behaviour uh, related to domestic abuse gives us an opportunity to make additional provision for uh, children who can very often be uh, uh, victims of domestic abuse uh, that takes place in the household in which they are uh, living. We have been engaged with a range of the stakeholders who have expressed uh, a view to look at uh, making specific provision within uh, the legislation. I am um, uh, sure the member will uh, recognise that it would be inappropriate for me at this stage before it has been introduced to Parliament uh, to give details on exactly what will be contained within the bill. But what I can give the member an assurance of is that this is an issue which we do recognise there is further progress to be made on. Uh, for example, it could be the issue of an aggravation could be provided within the legislation to try and address these types of issues to ensure that they are properly recognised by the court uh, when a case is being considered. So I can give the member an assurance uh, that we are looking to try and address some of these issues in the legislation and I hope uh, that when the bill is introduced to Parliament it will draw cross-party support given its intention in making sure that the Scottish justice system is one of the leaders within the world in making sure that we criminalise psychological coercive and controlling behaviour that is related to domestic abuse. Question number six, Neil Findlay. To ask the Scottish Government uh, what action it is taking to ensure that victims in Scotland of unethical undercover policing have access to justice. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the options available to any individual will depend on the facts and circumstances of their case. Uh, depending on the particular circumstances, individuals uh, may seek redress via the Investigatory Pillars Tribunal, which has jurisdiction to consider certain proceedings for actions which concern the use of investigatory powers. Additionally, individuals may seek redress through the courts, subject to the rules which determine the jurisdiction of the courts. Mr Finlay is also aware that I have directed HMICS to undertake a review of undercover policing in Scotland. The terms of reference uh, were published today. The review will be essential in gathering facts about existing and historical undercover policing activities over the period of the Scottish Parliament when it's had responsibilities for this area and will inform any further decisions that we make in this area. Neil Findlay. Uh, why is it that Scottish victims of illegal and unethical undercover policing activity carried out in Scotland prior to the year 2000 will not have access to any inquiry, yet victims in England and Wales will? The Cabinet Secretary has the opportunity to remedy this by ensuring the strategic review of undercover policing in Scotland covers the same time period as the Pitchford Inquiry in England and Wales. That is back to 1968. Why won't the Cabinet Secretary do this? And what advice does he have for victims who became victims in that time period prior to 2000? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Senator, I consider this issue uh, very carefully, and I do believe that the most appropriate way 
in which for the issue of undercover policing in particular, the activities of uh, the Metropolitan uh, Police Units who were involved in undercover policing operations across the UK and Scotland and in uh, Northern Ireland, that that should be addressed to the Pitchford Inquiry. Um, I regret the fact that the UK Government have refused to extend that although, as a member, will be aware that it is within the gift of the chair of that particular inquiry to consider evidence uh, which comes from out with England and Wales, uh, so long as it relates to an undercover operation carried out by a police force in England and Wales. So there is issues, uh, but I believe that the UK government uh, should have addressed and they failed to do so. Uh, what I've uh, done in establishing the uh, uh, inquiry by uh, HMICS is to look at the period when this parliament and the legislation uh, which was established in order to deal with undercover policing was passed by both the UK and by the Scottish Parliament to look at the provisions which were in place during that period of time, the arrangements that the police had in place, and as the terms of reference which have been set out by the Chief Inspector today will, I believe, allow a very thorough and detailed investigation to take place. If there are individuals that believe that they have been subject to some form of undercover policing operation that predate that period, then I would welcome hearing that from them. Uh, but to date, I have not received that type of information uh, beyond what will be covered uh, within the time frame that has been set by HMICS and the terms of reference that it published today. Gordon Lindhurst. Um, I welcome the limited review announced today, but I'm concerned about how the Scottish Government can restore public confidence in the police and maintain that confidence going forward. Uh, in light of that, can the Cabinet Secretary provide reassurances that sensitive operational techniques and details uh, will be safeguarded throughout the review process? Cabinet Secretary. Well, uh, I'm sure the member will uh, recognise that there is significant public confidence in the way in which the uh, police, uh, uh, police Scotland uh, operate and all the public surveys uh, demonstrate that. In relation to this particular inquiry, um, it is for the uh, Chief Inspector to conduct a very detailed and thorough inquiry. I'm sure the member will recognise the background of uh, the Chief Inspector, Derek Penman, um, who is an individual who has spent an extended uh, period within uh, policing in Scotland and a very distinguished career within Scotland at the highest level. And I've got no doubt that he will recognise the need to make sure that the way in which information is handled in relation to this issue, which is sensitive, is dealt with uh, appropriately. Um, I'm sure the member would also recognise, as all members will recognise, is that uh, covert operations and surveillance operations play an important part in tackling serious and organised crime in this country uh, and other serious threats within our society. And it's appropriate that our police service uh, and uh, the police force have the ability to be able to undertake these types of procedures appropriately. Equally, it's also important that we have robust measures in place to ensure that these are appropriately and effectively regulated. I believe that we do have uh, a strong regulation in place at the present moment. The Investigatory Powers Act it will change some of those provisions, which I believe will improve it in some areas, not entirely, but it will improve it in some areas. Uh, but it's important that we allow the police services to, or police service to have these necessary powers. And I've got no doubt that after we've received the uh, report from the Chief Inspector, we'll be able to reflect on its findings. And if there are any recommendations that suggest that we have to take action in order to provide further safeguards or improvements in uh, the way in which Police Scotland conduct these matters, then we as a government will be determined to take them forward, and I've got no doubt that Police Scotland will be determined to implement them. Question number nine, Neil Bibby. To ask the Scottish Government what response it has received to its consultation on the integration of the British Transport Police in Scotland into Police Scotland. Cameron Secretary. An independent analysis report on the response to the consultation was carried out by the research shop uh, and can be found on the Scottish Government Consultation Hub website. Responses to the consultation have now been published online. Uh, railway policing in Scotland is now a devolved matter, a decision reached with cross-party agreement through the Smith Commission. Uh, that means that we need to put in place a framework to deliver appropriate accountability for railway policing to the Scottish Parliament and the people of Scotland. The Scottish Government has set out why it believes integration is the most effective means of achieving that, as well as providing operational benefits through direct access to a range of specialist support within Police Scotland. This will deliver much stronger and more effective accountability than could be achieved within a cross-border public body structure. Neil Bibby. It is concerning that the consultation didn't specifically ask the question, do you support the merger or not? We know from 
The responses the government received that there is significant opposition and concerns about the proposed merger from rail unions, train companies and police officers. The Transport Minister claimed the government has a manifesto mandate to push through this merger, uh, but they do not. Given all of this, given the level of opposition amongst people who work on our railways, the problems we have seen from the creation of Police Scotland and other public sector reforms, what confidence can the public possibly have that this merger is a good idea and will be a success. Cabinet Secretary. Well, as the member may be aware, the uh, view of the Scottish Government in integrating British transport policing into uh, Police Scotland is not a new idea. It is an idea which was set out back in 2011, which my uh, predecessor had, had pursued as well. And it was a, a policy which we had also set out in our uh, white paper. But the member will also recognise that the Smith Commission's recommendations reached through cross-party agreement, including his own uh, party, was that the functions of British Transport Police in Scotland should be devolved to uh, the Scottish Parliament. Uh, and I, I think it's appropriate that we put in, in place a structure in order to provide appropriate accountability in order to uh, take that forward and to ensure that there is accountability to this Parliament and to the Scottish people. I should uh, sign off, so say that uh, given the political interest that there has been in this matter, I was struck by the lack of response from any of the other political parties to our consultation on this issue, including no response from Mr Bibby's party on our consultation into this matter. So given that he believes it is such an important issue, I am surprised he didn't take the opportunity to make his view known to the consultation process. Briefly, Douglas Ross. This is an opportunity for opposition parties to make their views very clear. The Scottish Government's own analysis of the responses to the consultation highlighted the prevailing opposition to full-on integration. Does the Cabinet Secretary not agree that the best way to maintain our high standard of specialist railway policing and ensure the safety of rail passengers and staff is not to radically alter an established and successful model, and that could be achieved under the Smith Agreement? So, Senior Officer, there we are again. We have cross-party agreement that we should have the devolution of railway policing to the Scottish Parliament, but no idea on how that should be achieved because, yet again, this is another party who failed to even bother to respond to the consultation exercise. Clearly, they see this has been a high priority, but don't have the ability to set out how they believe it should actually be uh, done, which I think is uh, rather telling on the opposition parties in this issue. I've got no doubt, sign officer, that the way in which we can deliver effective and specialist policing on our railways is to have it integrated within uh, Police Scotland, as Police Scotland have already set out. They intend to have specialist railway policing continue to be provided once it has been integrated into uh, the service. And in doing so, that will allow them also to have access to the specialist assets that Police Scotland have as a national force as well. And in addition to that, it will provide accountability to this Scottish Parliament and to all of the parties in this chamber as to how policing is delivered on our railways. It's just disappointing that none of the parties bother to take the time to make their views known during the consultation exercise. Thank you. We we'll move on to culture, tourism and external affairs questions. And we'll start with question number one from Edward Mountain. To ask the Scottish Government how important it considers super-fast broadband is to tourism in the Highlands. The Scottish Government considers super-fast broadband is very important to businesses in the Highlands and Islands and tourism in particular. Commercial coverage provision by the UK Government would have only reached 21% of the Highlands and Islands. That is why we are investing £400 million in the Digital Scotland Superfast Broadband Programme to extend fibre access to at least 95% of premises by the end of 2017 and we have committed to delivering 100% coverage by the end of this Parliament. Edward Mountain. I'm constantly asked in the Highlands when, when the provision of broadband will be, especially for those last 5%. So will the government, as part of their R100 programme, let businesses know the likely rollout dates for superfast broadbands? This will allow these businesses to commit to alternative broadband provision until the terrestrial broadband promised by the Scottish Government is available. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well 
already been extensive coverage, but it's quite right to identify the last 5%. And I think the communication, particularly of the procurement process for that final 5% uh, that we're embarking on as part of this additional funding that's part of the budget going forward for 17-18 and throughout this parliamentary term, it's key that we actually can plan and respond. And that's also critical, not just in terms of knowing when that activity will be available, but for also skills and training, because use of digital marketing is a vital part of that tourism offer as well. Liam MacArthur. Thank you very much. Can I welcome the comments the Cabinet Secretary made in relation to that final 5%. But even for those businesses that currently have a broadband service, they can be adversely affected by weather disruption at this time of the year. Many wait weeks, if not months, uh, in my part of the world to get those faults uh, fixed. This can have a huge impact on tourism and indeed other businesses, not to mention the households. So will the Cabinet Secretary undertake to ensure that the Scottish Government make representations to BT to ensure that they have the resources and what they require to ensure that these faults are, are dealt with far more speedily than appears to be the case to date. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I'm afraid I'm not responsible for the weather, uh, but in terms of his identification of the disruption that can cause, particularly to some of the connect connectivity issues, uh, although it's not my direct responsibility, I will make sure that Derek Mackay, who is the uh, Cabinet Secretary responsible, uh, makes sure that the business needs and the business opportunities and the business losses that can accrue because of that disruption are brought to the attention of, the, of BT in particular. And in my discussions with BT as a Tourism Secretary, I will also make sure that's raised. Question number two, George Adam. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it is promoting culture in towns and cities. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government uh, promotes culture in a wide variety of ways across many portfolios, not just my own, for example, in education. We promote culture through our supporting guidance to national cultural bodies, through letters of grant and guidance, which they can del deliver, then deliver in towns and cities, for example, through Creative Scotland's Place Partnerships or through outreach work from our national performing companies and the collections. The cultural strategy we're preparing will also provide more opportunities to explore this. And the jointly COSLA chairs culture conveners and local government meetings that I've initiated will help identify other opportunities for our towns and cities. George Allen. I thank the Cabinet Secretary, Secretary for her answer. Would the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that cultural activities can be a key factor in town centre and uh, city regeneration, particularly for a town like Paisley with its vast iconic cultural background? Even Edinburgh's world-famed Hugman A Party was taken over by Paisley Axis last year. And is this not another reason, an example, as why Paisley should be the UK City of Culture in 2021? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, as the member knows, and as he is a great champion of the Paisley case for UK City of Culture, um, it, it, I strongly believe in the regenerative uh, powers of culture, both uh, in a social, individual, but also in an economic sense. And we're seeing that in towns and cities across Scotland, not least obviously Dundee. But I would also point out to the member, as part of the campaign for uh, Paisley in particular, on Monday night I was speaking at the Creative Industries Federation and I met the uh, award-winning fashion icon, uh, Pam Hogg, who was advocating Paisley's case through the many hundreds of people that were there at that event. Jamie Green. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, may I uh, join Mr Adam in uh, supporting his uh, uh, bid for Paisley's uh, bid for UK City of Culture, for something we share on this side of the chamber, myself anyway. Uh, but a big part of culture of our towns and cities in Scotland are, are, are historic uh, castles and ancient monuments. I could ask the Cabinet Secretary for her response to this week's analysis by Historic uh, Environment Scotland that shows that up to £65 million will be required to maintain and keep these sites in satisfactory condition. And given that we're seeing a 4.5% cut to our country's national collection in this year's budget, how confident can this chamber be that this government will protect our historic sites? Secretary. Well, I, I welcome the report because I actually commissioned the report because I think it's the first time in hundreds of years that we actually have a proper survey of what the demands and requirements are. And you'll also be aware that uh, on Monday this week I announced £6.6 .6 million of capital investment for Historic Environment Scotland precisely to invest in the work uh, to restore and conserve 
our uh, properties in care. That helps skills and training. It also helps local contractors. And indeed, Historic uh, Environment Scotland uh, spend around £3 million a year in local, with local contractors on that work. But his point about um, the investment in Historic Environment Scotland, uh, they have actually seen uh, an increase precisely because of the additional uh, over uh, £2.5 million or £2.4 million pounds of additional capital investment to Historic Environment Scotland. And actually, their position is much better than it's been for many, many years because I strongly and firmly believe if we're going to have tourism at the heart of our economy and our historic environment, our buildings and our castles are places that people want to visit, we have to invest in it. And that's why I made that announcement uh, this week. And it's also why I commissioned the report that he referred to. Question number three, Douglas Ross. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what recent assessment it has made of the tourism sector in the Highlands and Islands. Cabinet Secretary. As one of our key uh, growth sectors is vital to all of Scotland's economy, the latest Scottish Government statistics for the Highlands and Islands show an increase in tourism employment and GVA together with visitor numbers and spend. ONS statistics published on Visit Scotland's uh, website on the 10th of January show that between 2014 and 15, the number of people employed in the sector across Scotland grew to 217,000. The 11% increase in Scotland is above the 4% rise in Great Britain as a whole, and the 217,000 members members of the Scottish tourism industry um, and employees of the, the industry represent 9% of the country's total employment and is the highest tourism level since the Business Register Employment Survey records began in 2009. And of these, uh, the 15,700 tourism workers in the Highlands makes up 14% of the region's total. Douglas Ross. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. She will be aware that as today is the 11th of January, it's also the date of the burning of the clavy in Burghead. This attracts thousands of tourists and local people to the village. As clavy king Dan Ralph and his crew prepare to carry the flaming wooden clavy barrel filled with tar on their backs around the village, stopping at several doorways to hand out the burning embers before finally being wedged on Dury Hill, will the Cabinet Secretary join me in praising this tradition, the interest it generates both local Locally and from further afield, and the enthusiasm of younger members of the Clavey team, such as Jamie Davidson, Scott Crawford, and Keir Irwin, who are following in the footsteps of their ancestors, being part of the Clavey crew. I, I would like to uh, congratulate the Clavey King and uh, all those involved in what I understand is a really vibrant and uh, inclusive event, uh, which uh, I, I think plays a uh, tribute to the, the long-standing heritage of not only just that, that place itself, but of Scotland. And of course, we are now in 2017. It's the year of history, heritage and archaeology. And it's not just our built environment that we want to celebrate. The intangible heritage of this country, which includes the traditions that he's just referred to, is very much part of Scotland's heritage as well. Kate Forbes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The numbers of tourists going to the Isle of Skye are growing exponentially year on year, contributing to Scotland's national economy, but also putting huge pressure on our infrastructure. Would the Cabinet Secretary meet with me to discuss ways to ensure that our services and infrastructure can meet this rapidly growing demand? Well, well, clearly tourism uh, is growing. I've, I've talked about the employee numbers and obviously in terms of uh, recent announcement, the Rough Guide has now pointed out that Scotland is the number two place in the world to visit this year. We have to make it the number one place. But with that demand, creates tensions in terms of infrastructures uh, in a number of places and particularly in the Highlands and Islands and I know in Sky and other areas, uh, that is, is creating real, uh, re real challenges. Uh, I'm more than happy to meet the member to discuss uh, the issues in her constituency, as I have offered to, to other members for the North Coast 500. Question number four, Ben McPherson. To ask the Scottish Government whether, whether it will provide an update on any communication it has had with the UK Government regarding the publication of Scotland's place in Europe. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the First Minister spoke to the Prime Minister upon publication uh, when Theresa May repeated her pledge made in July that the UK Government would give full and fair consideration to our proposals designed to mitigate the risk for Scotland of being taken out of the EU. In addition, our Minister for UK Negotiations on Scotland's place in Europe spoke with the Secretary of State for exiting the EU and the Secretary of State for Scotland and highlighted the need for full and constructive debate of our proposition. The Scottish Government will formally table our proposals at the Joint Ministerial Committee EU negotiations next week and I hope that discussions take place in the spirit of agreeing a UK approach. The UK Government has emphasised the need for Scotland's full engagement and an agreed UK-wide approach before the triggering of Article 50 and we welcome that commitment. Ben McPherson. 
At those discussions, would the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that there is a need also to emphasise the fact that there's deep concerns, not just for myself, but also from constituents in my constituency and across Scotland, that as well as clarity on the position on the paper, we also need clarity for the EU nationals in our community who still haven't had any clarity from the UK Government as to the rights of uh, their uh, ability to stay in Scotland. Cabinet Secretary. I ab absolutely agree, and this uh, government have been clear right from day one that the position of EU nationals uh, living in, in Scotland and working in Scotland and contributing to our economy and society have to be secured. Um, I think that it's essential that we do that sooner rather than later. I am concerned that uh, the UK government hasn't chosen to do so, not least because they will be required to do so at some point. And I think in going into negotiations um, with the other EU countries and with the EU itself, it really is important they are not used as pawns but the goodwill faith and confidence of uh, respect for each other's citizens needs to lie at the heart of whatever solution can be realized as part of the overall negotiations and having confidence faith and trust in peoples uh, that are working here will give great confidence i think in other eu countries in uh, uh, approaching those negotiations when they start in good faith and in goodwill jackson carlo um, can I again, on behalf of Scottish Conservatives, uh, thank the Scottish Government for the publication of the Scotland's Place in Europe, acknowledge that it is a substantial document, and indeed note that there are certain recommendations within it which enjoy all party support. Uh, does she share the disappointment of some, however, at the fact that the document has been uh, dismissed out of hand by certain European capitals and governments? And how, in the face of that, given that it would need the unanimous support of all the capitals of Europe for these provisions to proceed, would she advocate that the UK Government take matters forward? Cabinet Secretary. I, I would gently correct the member that it hasn't been dismissed out of hand by certain capitals and countries. I myself have spoken to a number of governments, either at ministerial or ambassadorial level. He may be referring to remarks made by the Spanish European minister, the same comments that he made three months ago, recognising that it would be the UK that would be the negotiator and that it would expect the position to be put forward would be one put forward for the UK as a whole. If you listen to my first answer, I was quite clear, as the government has been, that it's part of a UK negotiation that we're putting forward the proposal that are in uh, the paper that he has said has been well regarded in a number of uh, substantive points I think can get cross-party support. So I think we've got to be very careful not to put words in the mouths of other governments. I think that one is un uh, undiplomatic, but, second but secondly, I don't think helps Scotland's case. Let's try and talk, let's try and identify the areas we can agree on and take them forward as part of the EU negotiation. And that's the spirit that one, we publish the document, but we'll also take them forward in the discussions that we'll have with the UK government. Louise MacDonald. Thank you very much. The Cabinet Secretary mentioned that uh, she intends these proposals will be tabled at the meeting of the Joint Ministerial Committee next week. In that context, can she tell us what discussions she or colleagues may have had with the Welsh Government or with other devolved administrations in advance of that meeting in order to ensure that the uh, proposition of a joint UK approach is one that has broad support? Cabinet Secretary. I, I may reflect to, to the member in the chamber that uh, the reason that Michael Russell is not answering these questions personally himself is because he's precisely engaged um, in discussions uh, on, on this issue um, with other governments uh, in particular. We have had discussions uh, both uh, on a bilateral basis uh, with the other jurisdictions in Scotland and also at the British Irish Council and indeed um, uh, both in a formal and informal context around the British Irish Council uh, I spoke to uh, the Welsh Government at uh, uh, Carmen Jones, the, the First Minister, and uh, also the other ministers attending. So we're very conscious that uh, a lot of these discussions, there'll be common interests, there'll be different ways of approaching it. But what is essential, as I think we're now getting on to, is the importance and centrality of the single market as being part of whatever proposition the, the UK negotiation puts forward and how we express that collectively across the jurisdictions and also from this chamber will be very important in influencing the final result that we get. Question number five, Dean Lockhart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it is implementing the strategy Tourism Scotland 2020. 
Secretary. The Government Economic Strategy identifies tourism as a key growth sector. The Scottish Government is therefore assisting public bodies to support the tourism sector right across Scotland via the industry-led Scottish Tourism Alliance Tourism Strategy 2020, collectively across the public agencies, uh, especially Visit Scotland, Scottish Enterprise, Highlands and Islands Enterprise, Skills Development Scotland and Scottish Development International and the relevant local authorities. Dean Lockhart. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. Given that tourism is indeed one of the Government's key growth areas and is an increasing contributor to the Scottish economy with increasing tourist numbers uh, this year or last year, and given all the opportunities highlighted by the Cabinet Secretary, can I ask why at such an important stage in implementing this strategy has the Scottish Government decided to cut the resources for tourism by 10% in the draft budget? And why have critical agencies such as Visit Scotland faced a 20% real terms reduction in funding over the last eight years? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I would uh, correct the member in his understanding. If he refers to last year's budget and this year's budget, he will see for Visit Scotland actually there is a flat cash uh, announcement in terms of their funding. And indeed, if you paid attention to the evidence that was given by the Chief Executive at the budget session, session he specifically said that they welcomed the flat cash funding that was available for them to spend. Some of the issues, if he looks at last year's budget, the, the contribution from Visit Scotland to um, the Strategic Forum was identified in last year's budget. Uh, this year, we've, we've made it clear up front what the resources are. So the flat cash settlement for Visit Scotland has very much been welcomed uh, by not, not, not only the organisation uh, but others as well within the tourism sector if he had the opportunity to speak to them. Question number six, Sandra White. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what the implications are for Creative Europe funded projects in light of the EU referendum result. The, the Creative Europe, uh, Europe programme has been of significant value to the Scottish cultural sector. Uh, following the EU referendum result, uh, the Scottish Government is concerned about the future of this programme and uh, uh, very conscious of time, I would indicate that uh, since its uh, uh, foundation in 2014, there have been 33 projects uh, fund with funding of more than, a, uh, uh, with more than a fun with funding of more than 11.5 million <laughs> euros. Sandra Hoyt. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Several projects in my constituency, Y Dance in particular, have received report for uh, Creative Europe. It's very important, I think, and I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary agrees with me, that it's very important that areas like Y Dance and Creative Europe funding continue. And would she agree with me that it's probably one of the worst things to come out of uh, the Brexit in Europe if this funding is not continued? Uh, absolutely. In terms of the creative industries and culture, uh, so much of the, the, the value of it is the exchange of ideas and experience, and Creative Europe certainly does that and facilitates that. And it's actually being able to develop your practice with international connections that's as important as the actual grants and skills itself. So again, as part of our ongoing work on the EU, one will be enc encouraging people to still work with the Creative Europe desk. Um, they certainly have the opportunity still to do so. And we want to make it clear that, these, that this is one of the organisations that we expect and the, the funding streams that the UK will either replace or preferably continue uh, uh, after the EU referendum because some of these relationships are absolutely vital to the, the heartbeat of our culture. Sector. Thank you. And that concludes portfolio questions. We'll just take a few uh, a moment or two to change seats for the Minister for the next debate.